now the question becomes, uh, so if it's not, so is it really the case that the world religions have sort of wiped out these indigenous religions and they just don't exist anymore in those parts of the globe? And the answer is, of course, it's not that simple. Um, it's not that simple at all. So I say here displacement or hybridity, and what I mean by that is we tend to think of it in terms of like this. We tend to think that when a world religion moves into the area, um, either the world religion kind of dominates and takes over, I'm calling that total conversion and acculturation. Conversion is a change of religion. Acculturation is an adoption of a dominant culture. So we tend to think, oh, you know, Christianity moves into the area, dominates the area now. Islam moves into an area, dominates the area now. Or rejection, right? The world religion is not adopted, and so that's why you have areas like um, Siberia, where you have still predominantly indigenous religiosity. So that's kind of a very binary way that I think we sometimes think of it, either the world religion moves in and dominates, or the world religion hasn't moved into the area yet, or for some reason has not gained a foothold. And of course, we can see examples of the, this, right? We can see um, examples of this binary where, for example, there was complete rejection of a world religion. Uh, as one example, um, there was, of course, Catholic proselytization, um, as well as Spanish forced labor going on in what we now think of as New Mexico and Arizona uh, during the early 1600s. Um, there was, the goal was mineral wealth extraction. It quickly became clear that there wasn't that much mineral wealth there, at least immediately available. Uh, but Pueblo people were used, among other things, um, to for like forced labor, um, as well as were also proselytized too. Um, it was the Spanish colonialism in the region was pretty heavy-handed uh, and included at one point the execution of several dozen religious elders, which then led to a response called the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, where this man, this is a statue of Pope. Um, an indigenous Pueblo man who formulated a revolt across many, many, several different native tribes throughout the Southwest where they would all revolt on the same day. He used a, like a knotted rope to communicate. So if you're not familiar with New Mexico and Arizona, there are Native American tribes found in many, many different places, some of them close together, some of them very far spread apart. Pope and others were able to coordinate all these different Pueblo tribes, uh, as well as some of the other groups, to revolt against the Spanish on the same day, because the fact of the matter was, although there may have been superior firepower on the part of the Spanish, um, there were far fewer Spanish colonizers than there were native folks. So when they weren't divided up, but they were instead united and kind of revolting at the same time, they were able to pretty easily chase out uh, the conquistadors and the Catholic priests and the other colonizers, um, storm Santa Fe, and eventually kind of leave New Mexico and Arizona as indigenous territory again, uh, thus rejecting both Spanish colonialism and Catholicism presence in the Southwest for about 12 years before uh, the Reconquista um, of the Southwest. But very, very sort of overt rejection of a foreign presence. Uh, certainly that's not sort of only a 1600s thing. We could think of the example of the Sentinel Islands. Uh, you may have heard of this case back in 2018. Uh, there was a man who pro was proclaiming himself a missionary. Other people contest that and say that he was more of a tourist. Um, but he proclaimed that he was... Um, trying to spread Christianity, um, visited the, attempted to visit the Sentinel Islands. Um, I believe they had been warned him not to, but he did anyways. And he was killed. This young man was killed uh, by the Sentinelese. And so there are cases where cultures just straight up say no, no world religion presence here for one reason or another. And there are certainly examples of religion sort of wholesale taking on or a region, an area, sort of wholesale taking on a new religion and it becoming by far and away their dominant power. Um, in reality, though, most situations are somewhere in between, or at least a lot of situations are. Total rejection and total conversion are not the only two options when a culture is faced with a world religion. I'd like to talk about some of the in-between options. Let's think of this as a spectrum of religious adoption or rejection, and think of the fact that between these two extremes, there are some other positions that many cultures occupy, which include hybridity, syncretism, and localization. Let's talk about each. Let's talk first about the idea of syncretism. We've talked about this before, but I'd like to review. Syncretism 
uh, again, refers to the idea of religions blending together. And traditionally, it usually has the connotation that one has been subsumed under another. Uh, sometimes when used simplistically, and it's when people were first developing this theory, almost the idea of like one religion being a mask over another. So Vodou was often interpreted as sort of, well, uh, you have Catholic saints that are kind of being plastered on top of the Orishas within Yoruba religion, Yoruba traditional sacred practices. Um, that's pretty simplistic, right? I think it's really simplistic. Uh, we might better think of it as sort of religion one and religion two creating complex combinations that we call syncretism, although usually with one kind of feeling more influential than the other. And a really good example of such syncretism would be the Judas off the noose reading, right? And we talked about that was not from this time. This was from the beginning of the semester, and we've talked about it before. And so I'm not going to belabor the point, other than to remind you that the veneration of San Simon was regarded by many Mayan people uh, in that study to also represent Mac Simon and Mam, who are two important Mayan deities, and also um, other elements as well, but for our purposes, a stand-in for Mayan deities. And indeed, the idea being, as is often the case with syncretism, you kind of have two concepts from two religions that sort of blend well together or have a good resonance together. In this case, the idea of Maximon and Mam as sort of creator deities, and then Judas is associated with the wildness of nature, so kind of combining those two ideas. Now, what I found really interesting and that that reading brought out, and more so later in the reading, the part that I didn't have you read, was the idea that it wasn't just syncretism, but there was also anti-syncretism. And what I mean by anti-syncretism is forces that were seeking to stop the blending of traditional Mayan religion with Catholic religion, despite this having gone on for a century 400 years. And so you had, uh, for example, Catholic priests who were imploring their um, parishioners to not go to the festival of San Simon or to remember who San Simon really is and not sort of associate him with Mayan deities. Um, at the same time, you have the Sacerdotes Maya operating in Guatemala at the time, which are a group of people, uh, primarily urban Mayans uh, intellectuals, but others as well, uh, who are attempting to sort of purify um, Mayan religious practices. They view it as sort of, I guess from their point of view, we would say that the Catholicism is the plaster and the Mayan religion is what's really going on underneath and that we just need to get the Catholicism out. Uh, so you have sacerdotes Mayas, so groups of people that are sort of trying to go back to pure Mayan religious practices before the colonizers got here. Now, of course, you can see the challenge with that. Uh, the challenge is it's been 500 years, and there was active persecution of Mayan religion during the early days of Spanish colonialism, including burning of codices. Uh, so, although certainly there's been a, various forms of continuity, including shamans teaching shamans, uh, there's also been a great deal of loss of religiosity, uh, or at the very least, heavy, heavy persecution, and things sort of having to go more underground. And so... In a sense, then, sacerdotes Maya face a problem that's not entirely similar, dissimilar from some neo-pagan practitioners within Europe, which is how to get back to an indigenous religious tradition if A, there wasn't a written record, B, there was a written record, or, but as in the case of the Maya, many of the written, written records were destroyed, uh, and C, there's been heavy persecution by or replacement by a world religion, and it's been hundreds of years, so how do you get back to those earlier practices? How do you know if you're getting back to sort of the authentic religious practices of your indigenous ancestors? So it's a problem that it would be faced by anti-syncretists. Uh, and again, this just to stress, among other things, um, that in traditional Mayan religion, which involves, among other things, stories of the hero twins who descend into the underworld, um, store shamanic practices, um, ceremonies done on sacred mountains, many different important practices that honor um, natural phenomena and important deities. But within this context, uh, oftentimes religious teachings were, con were recorded within codices using written Mayan glyphs. Um, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, I recommend the book 2,000 Years of Mayan Literature by Dennis Tedlock. Um, these Mayan glyphs, uh, as a type of syllabic form of writing, uh, are really, really complex. Not only are they ideographic in the sense that they're visually representative of whatever they're talking about, but there's often like puns worked into them uh, and little like linguistic markers and all sorts of more complex things than just sort of a picture, right? Um, there's a lot going on in these glyphs. Linguistically speaking, a very complex and layered linguistic system. 
uh, many of these codices tragically were burned, and as a result, we have far fewer of them. We, um, Ah, oh, gosh. If you count Mayan and then a few of the other related groups are, you can probably count on a couple of hands, um, the really sort of fully formed codices that we have access to. All right, well, um, Catholicism, the Catholicization of Mesoamerica is to say that um, if you were to look statistically at it, you would say that in Latin, the Latin American and Caribbean region in 1910, about 90% were Catholic. So after 400 years of colonialism, um, and after some after conversions, both voluntary, some voluntary and some not, um, you had a situation where the vast majority of the region was Catholic. Um, by 2010, that number had reduced considerably, in part because of the rise of um, evangelical Christianity as a prominent force within Latin America, uh, but still the number was 72%, so extremely high. So if you looked at that graph alone, you'd say, wow, uh, the vast majority of Mesoamerica is Catholic, uh, and that includes uh, Guada the vast majority of what used to be called Mesoamerica, and we now think of Central America, is Catholic, and that includes Guatemalan Mayans. Uh, but in reality, as the San Simon picture shows us, it's actually uh, not so much the case that my, m indigenous religions just disappeared, all these sort of in different indigenous nations with different indigenous religions, it's not the case that it just sort of disappeared, but as the San Simon example shows us, as other exam pra examples of Mayan Catholic practices show us, is that in many cases the indigenous religions continue to inhabit and be a part of this space, not only through groups like the sacerdotes Maya that seek to represent a, quote, pure Mayan spirituality, um, but also through syncretistic practices. So. Um, I put here a question, you know, and I asked you this earlier in the semester as well, but I'll reiterate it now and maybe ask you to pause and think about it, but is this traditional Mayan religion, does all this syncretism mean that the indigenous religion of the Maya continues, or is it Catholicism? And I would say to both questions, yes, <laughs> or rather I would say you cannot really ever know religion without its local context. Religion always varies by context, and it's important that you understand that Catholicism when we're speaking as social scientists, is not just one thing, right? Uh, if we were to speak more theologically, yes, you could identify sort of Catholicism in its purity, uh, but if we speak as social scientists, we would say Catholicism as it moves around the world is very much caught up in local circumstances and transforms. Uh, but we would say equally true, um, something like Mayan spirituality cannot be known outside of its temporal context. Um, what is Mayan spirituality? Uh, is modern day veneration of San Simon slash Maximon uh, any less Mayan spirituality uh, than sort of pure veneration, quote unquote, of Maximon 500 years ago? Uh, I think, again, you can't really know a religion outside of its local context and its temporal or time context. Finally, I would ask, why syncretize? And I think we can think of lots of reasons why. Um, one that many people will bring up is, of course, survival, right? Uh, if you're being forced to convert, this is a way of continuing indigenous religious practices, but perhaps then it just kind of takes hold over time, this new combination that was done in part out of survival. But I think that if we only think of it that way, um, we do a disservice to folks and to the legitimacy, authenticity, and richness of their spiritual traditions, including syncretic spiritual traditions, which I would argue is many religious traditions. Um, I think we forget the fact that another reason syncretism happens is because people legitimately come into contact with new religions or indigenous religions and find something there of value and choose to combine them, uh, or because they see some kind of a resonance, right? They see some kind of a X and Y seem similar to each other, and so let's put them together because I think they're the same thing. Uh, so people are creative and innovative with religion. They don't just sort of even if religion's traditional, it's not just traditions, right? People mix and match and innovate religion with each passing generation. Okay, I'm going to pause there. <laughs>